And if you want, this is the mic. You can pin that to your shirt. You can hold it up. Do whatever you need to do. Okay. Um, if you need to hand that back to you, I'll pass it to the next. Okay, perfect. Testing. Is it on? Emily can hear us. Oh, so this is only for the Zoom, not for these people, right? Hi, Emily. Can you hear us? Oh, I can hear you. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to um, Writing Across STEM and Humanities, Professional Communication and Information Literacy Through Public Facing Assignments That Transcend Disciplinary Boundaries. Am I loud enough for you guys? Barely. Barely. I can try to speak up. Okay, thank you so much. Um, maybe if I move over here. Oh my gosh, that would have actually be good. Um, we also don't need, well, we wanna see the speakers though. They'll come up when they're speaking. So um, how do we, okay, from beginning. How do you do full screen, you guys? Help me out here. <laughs> Can you make it full screen? Thank you so much. Thank you. And then to switch slides, what do I do? Return? Enter? Okay. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to get started. So what we're going to talk about here are three. Is it says better? Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Um, is um, three initiatives across our curriculum. And FYI, we are a college of health science. So what that means is all of our, most of our students are actually pre-med. They're all hoping to go on to med school, some dental, some farm. So it's completely science oriented. Everything is about the health sciences. Um, so what we're talking about today is an interdisciplinary approach across humanities and science courses, all with public facing assignments. So I'll just in quickly introduce our panel. So Liz um, is a, she teaches music and humanities. Jill teaches writing and rhetoric. Rosemary, who is here in person, teaches chemistry. Damon, who is here in pers person, teaches biology and genetics. Um, who's next on our list? Emily, who is online, teaches immunology and um, neuroscience. And I teach service learning and communication. So we will end our panel talking about the first year lower division courses, and we'll start with the final year courses. So, you know, that's the trajectory of how the um, public facing assignments work throughout the curriculum. Not turning the slide. Um, enter didn't work. That didn't work. Okay, I'll just use the mouse. Go ahead, Emily. All right. And so I, hi, everyone. I'm Emily. Um, just so you know, I can't quite see what's shown on your screen. So I'm just going to trust that the slides are the ones that I'm looking at on my computer. I think that's just how it's going to be. But um, hopefully things will line up just fine. Um, so today we'll be exploring how and why we assign blogs and infographics. Um, we're trying to offer students meaningful genres, so spurring them to think critically in order to communicate with high stakes purpose and audience in mind. So um, together, Teresa Joy and I collaboratively developed blog and infographic assignments um, for our vastly different courses, in my case, immunology, and she's teaching professional communication. Yeah, and so when we both are, we're pretty new to our institution and we just happened to be sitting next to each other at a faculty gathering talking about what we were doing in our very different courses. And we're like, oh my gosh, we should assign something together. And so we decided to design a blog and infographic assignments with the same learning outcomes, the same basic criteria, same basic rubric across both of our courses. But of course the content could not be more different. And the whole idea is we wanted to um, engage the students more and enhance their learning, right? So they'd have public audiences and public purposes. So, yeah, 
here we are. Um, you know, the idea was to bring together pedagogy and science and humanities to, um, and our purpose was the same, to use writing to better understand both of that content. How do you communicate? And then how do you learn immunology? And then um, using science, learning how to communicate science with future patients. All of our students pretty much wanna be doctors, most of them. It's been a really interesting journey for the two of us, certainly. Even after we developed the assignments, we met each week, we shared ideas for like, how do we teach these things in our classes? And how do we provide students with authentic feedback? Um, and I just have to share with you that we initially had um, a clip art of collaboration and we're like, wait a minute, we're talking about authentic assignments. So we have to put an authentic visual there on this slide. And so through this collaboration, I've really gotten a glimpse of what it's like to be a science professor. Uh, how do you do research in the sciences? Um, and also I, I've gotten a better idea of my students' experiences in the courses that matter to them, right? You know, they're taking the humanities fine, but they all wanna be scientists. So what does that look like for them? And we've also been able to be, to be vulnerable with each other, perhaps because we're from different disciplines, right? Um, share what we're not sure what we're doing and, um, and how we can better reach our students through doing this. And we, we definitely, the other thing that has been interesting about this is we hope that there are overlapping benefits for students because we talk about each other in our classes. So they can hopefully see the intersection of humanities and science through our work as well as what they're doing. Go ahead, Emily. Definitely, so as a scientist, um, assigning writing projects was new for me and a little intimidating, um, especially in sort of assessing and providing feedback um, and so I really, really appreciate the collaboration with Teresa Joy because um, with her support and help, I felt much more confident both assigning them and sort of coming up with assignment language and also creating rubrics and clearly communicating with my students what it is that I'm asking for. Um, so she generously shared her rubrics with me and provided wonderful examples of helpful feedback she gives for students, um, avoiding judgmental language and sort of helping guide them towards clearer communication in a bigger picture kind of way. Um, as a scientist, I sometimes get caught up in nitty gritties and um, trying to balance giving that sort of line by line feedback, which is not even my strength, but sometimes tempting uh, with more overarching guiding kind of um, feedback for students. Um, I think, especially at our institution, a lot of our students have a view of communication classes as being sort of less important than the hard science classes. Um, but I think that communication is especially important for our pre-health professionals who need to be able to both understand complex science and diagnoses, but also effectively communicate and educate their patients about those diagnoses and treatment options. And their patients may not have more than maybe sixth grade level science background, right? So. I think practicing that communication is really important. Um, and so comparing outcomes and notes on these similar assignments has given us a lot of good ideas of how to improve them. Um, it's inspired us to plan to hopefully collect some data and analyze the efficacy of this assignment um, for student learning. And um, I think in the next slides, Teresa Joy will help walk through, uh, or I guess both of us will be walking through our prompts and how our students react to them. Um, and how we'd like to maybe start the start the ball rolling for research and assessing effectiveness of these types of public assignments. All right. Go ahead, Emily. Yeah. Thank you. That, that looks right. Thanks. <laughs> um, so for my assignment, um, these are blogs in immunology. Um, students worked in groups of four or five to write one blog post of about a thousand words, um, and the topics are aligned each week with the course content. So each group only publishes one blog throughout the semester, but um, as a class, we update our blog weekly, sort of in alignment with the course content as we progress through the course. Um, and the instructions are to write an in, in an engaging way for a public audience, so very specific about the audience. Um, and generally speaking, that last bullet point is the hardest part for students. Almost every group brings me a first draft of a research paper, basically, a really nicely done research paper with all kinds of sources, which is great. Um, but, you know, it's it's really they, they come to talk to me and I give them some feedback about how to take this good information and turn it into something that a public audience might want to read and hopefully be able to understand. 
Um, so I was really impressed with how receptive they were to my feedback and how successful they were um, in being able to sort of translate their ideas from this more complex sciencey language to more accessible language. Um, so here on the right hand side of this slide, you can see uh, a list of the titles for the blogs that were posted last semester, just to give you kind of a general idea of the topics and um, some of the sort of range of creativity for that they came up with for the titles of their blogs and some of the content that they put in their blogs. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so go ahead. Thank you. So I wanted to share just an, one example. Um, these blogs are published publicly, um, which is sort of the point. So I just, I host a WordPress that um, students are able to access to upload their own work. So they're in charge of publishing. Um, and so we're happy to share our students' work with you. Um, if you want to check out the rest of the blog, I think it's awesome. Um, we're at chsimmunology.wordpress.com. Um, and so if, Teresa Joy, if you want to go to the website, I don't know if you can do I'll that. try. Let's see if this is going to work. If not, we'll just go with the sample that's on there. But. Oh, looks like it's working. Excellent. Uh, here today, gone tomorrow. Is that the right one? Uh, yep. And so you'll find a lot of the students um, enjoy putting puns in their um, in their blogs. Um, and so one of the things that I kind of wanted to know, if you can scroll down just a little bit um, and show sort of the graphic, I think that that's kind of part of the fun part. Yep, we got it. Melanoma cells. Awesome. OK. Um, so in this case, um, the students really get creative with their analogies, which I love. In this case, this is sort of video game themed. Um, and students, I asked them as part of the assignment to create some kind of a visual. And this group was really creative. They made a GIF. So I think it moves, right? I think it's moving? Yes. OK, cool, which I think is really genius and, and wonderful and fun. Um, showing This is showing tumor cells versus immune cells in a video game kind of a battle. Um, and I think it's really neat. So if you scroll down just a little bit farther, it shows sort of a different version of the same idea, but like with extra therapy, right? That it's more effective with therapy. So they had kind of a before and after. Um, and I think it's this is sort of a neat example because it's really challenging to simplify complex ideas effectively, right? That's one of the problems um, with scientific journalism in general, that most of the time journalists it's it's just really hard to keep the complexity and the subtleties of some of the studies when you're reporting on them, right? Um, uh, and so, you know, to try to simplify complex ideas and keep your analogies and explanations pretty accurate um, is a big challenge. And I was really impressed with how a lot of the students wrestled with it. So watching them struggle with that was really kind of part of the point. Um, and I'm really proud of how they came down in the end, most of these blogs really do keep pretty accurate in terms of the science and still clearly explain what it is they're trying to explain in a way people can understand without a big background in science. Um, so the other thing that I like to point out is how these blogs allowed students to use technology in unique ways, um, incorporating images, videos, linking sources directly in the text, um, as well as putting a bibliography at the end. But I really like the in-text links um, because it makes checking your sources um, easy and fast. Um, and it prevents them using sort of AI generated made up citations, uh, which is a bonus these days. <laughs> um, so um, now that I've shown you how the immunology blogs turned out a little bit, um, Teresa Joy will offer some details of the assignments in professional communication. Yes, thank you. and I. I feel bad. I can't follow that. So my apologies. <laughs> um, so for professional communication, um, they have to research and explain a health issue for their blog and then infographics. Their purpose is this is we kept we keep coming back to those rhetorical principles, right? Purpose and audience, purpose and audience. And as much as it's um, everyday language for us, it's actually something that people have to learn and keep thinking about. It's not the natural go to, which was interesting to me to find out. So it has to be a public audience. And what does a public audience want? They want guidance from a professional and they want very specific targeted knowledge. They don't have a lot of time and they wanna know some strategies, right? So what are those things that your audience needs? And then the purpose for the student team, they get to explore a health topic. They learn how to determine that audience. What do they already know? What do they need to take that action? And then the students are learning how to communicate and address audience needs quickly and accurately. 
these are students as as you could tell from Emily's presentations who are steeped in scientific knowledge and all this arcane and jargon you know how do you talk to people about these things in ways that help them um, so my journey through this has been very interesting and I decided to use LinkedIn as their as their public way I figured everybody has a LinkedIn page right so they publish their blogs and the infographics on their LinkedIn pages now, one of the things that I learned in the process is that actually not all students have LinkedIn pages and they don't know what it is or how to do it. So one of the things in my subsequent semesters is I had to build in a whole assignment around that. How do you create a professional LinkedIn page and what does it mean and so on and so forth. Among the other things that I struggled with in assigning this is um, initially we had talked about the same basic criteria, but in her class it was immunology and my class was techniques for professional communication. Well, in my first semester, that actually fell flat. They didn't care. <laughs> so what I was getting was very blase. Oh, this is how you communicate, right? So it was a learning for me. So the next semester, it was all about health issues. So they got to brainstorm together some health issue that they wanted to communicate. Um, it's a learning process, right? So, but we kept the same guidelines. It was still, they were learning professional communication, but the content was health, because that's what they cared about. The other thing they really struggled with was interviewing. How do I interview somebody who, um, who one would, would let me interview them as a student and would be pertinent to what my audience needs to know? A lot of them had friends who were doctors, whatever, but those weren't necessarily the best people to interview for that topic. So that was one of the things that they struggled with. The other thing is that I didn't realize how hard this is going to be for them. So the final draft became the second draft and we kind of started over again um, and game, went back and look at models and did another conference with me so I didn't realize kind of as Emily was saying too how hard it would be for them to put this into public language right so from then on we now we have two full drafts and then the third draft is the one that is the final draft and you know of course I want them to do well and get a good grade but if this is going to be public it actually has to be good Right, it's another reason to do that. So I'll show you here an example of an infographic because that was actually even much more difficult than a blog. Um, again, always coming back to purpose and audience, multiple drafts, their first drafts were full of meaningless clip art, like, a, a doctor right or or a needle or something right that was not at all connected really it wasn't giving any information yes it was health but it wasn't telling the reader anything and large chunks of text so we kept coming back well, well who is your audience and what do they need to know and what do they need to take action we had whole class discussions and the research and interview was really pivotal for them so for this infographic you will see their initial draft was dominated by what is the flu, what is the flu shot, of course, with clip art. But what they found through um, secondary research and through their interviews is that most people know those things. So really what their audience needs to know is, is it safe? They found a study where, and they were mostly targeting uninsured population. They found a study where the, where the people were not getting a flu shot because they were afraid they would get sick from it. Right? And so they, they just, they changed it all up and they made that the primary fo focus of their infographic. And they created the infographic on the right for the minor symptoms of the flu shot. And all the links go to their sources, right? It's one thing that we talked about is not having a big references page on an infographic. And yet you need to support what you're saying. So how do you do that? So those are, those are hyperlinked to sources. And then they added information trying to, because people didn't think it was that important actually to get a flu shot. So again, audience awareness there. Why, what, you know, you could die from the flu, essentially. And the other thing that the audience needed to know was they thought it would cost some money and they didn't know where to get one. So big emphasis on it's free. <laughs> yeah. And here's where to get one in your area. And so you just right there, the QR code takes them right to the clinics that offer them. So It was really fun and really helping them think about audience for that. Okay, I'm gonna skip my next slide so we can get to our next presenters. That's their first draft, we'll skip it. Um, Emily, do you wanna talk about this one quickly? We're running out of time. 
Yes, I'll be quick. So um, I don't think there was too much more I wanted to say that wasn't <laughs> written on this slide, um, but I did infographics in my class as well, and I found them a little bit less um, on target in terms of my learning outcome goals for my students. Um, and I think that that might just be based on the content that I'm interested in, in my course and sort of the context of the course that I'm teaching um, has a lot of content. So um, in terms of sort of comparing the blog to the infographic as assignments, um, I think the blog gives a little more space for complex ideas. And while infographics in some cases can help like focus students, um, my students were all trying to squeeze way too much into their infographic to show me that they knew things. Um, and in terms of outcomes, I found that often um, the students who put in the most work ended up with a pretty poor infographic, as you might judge an infographic, um, and students who were kind of cruising would sometimes put together a beautiful, clean, you know, simple infographic, but you could tell they didn't really get very deep into the knowledge. So I think um, for myself, for future things, I'm, I'm thinking of rolling them together. So to have students try to develop an infographic to put in their blog but not have it be a separate assignment, because I think having the text and the space that a blog provides to sort of support the ideas that are presented in the infographic will lighten that load a little bit and keep students from feeling like they have to put everything in the infographic um, and sort of even things out in terms of my ability to assess the actual content knowledge that they've been able to um, process and um, think about in the, in the, in the assignments. Thank you. So we will hold this for in case there are questions at the end about student surveys and how to assess this project, um, as well as this, so that uh, the other panelists can talk about where do we go now with assessment and with our courses. So I will turn it over to Jill and um, Liz, who are going to talk about this lesson. Go ahead, Jill and Liz. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I am Jill Dahlman and Liz Fox Myers here with me. Uh, so we're going to talk about um, our English 120 partnerships. Just to go ahead and give you a little bit of tiny background, English 120 is the research writing course that we have. And um, it typically happens in the spring semester, um, although what, every once in a while it happens in the fall, but mostly in the spring semester after the English 110. So um, this whole partnership began with um, with the pandemic, looking far away for the students to get engaged with writing that we are when they worked with each other. And so <clears throat> we adapted our English 120 course uh, jointly, collaboratively, uh, so that the health science majors actually had an opportunity to write for an authentic audience, even though they were locked up deep inside their homes. Please. Yeah, so um, so Jill set up this partnership and contacted their education department, um, and um, they sent a, a wish list of a lot of prompts. Um, they obviously had a need that we could tap into um, that our students were, were capable of doing as well, because that was important. Um, and so they sent a long list of these um, these prompts for us to work with, which really ranged across the board. I think it was about 150 prompts. Um, and I don't believe they gave any particular guidelines on, you know, how we execute those so we were able to kind of build it into our course in a way that made sense for our students. Uh, but that need for a connection with the outside world was really, um, was really key and, um, and the students really enjoyed kind of being able to explore that from their homes and I think it, it made them feel um, a little more connected, um, reminded them that there was an outside world there that was accessible because um, no, yes, we were on lockdown, but one thing that we could do um, in certain parts of the pandemic was, was to travel and perhaps be outside and enjoy those natural environments. Next slide, please. There you go. Thank you. Um, one of the, the national parks, as Liz mentioned, the national parks were open during the pandemic, um, and a lot of people found a lot of respite in it. Um, so one of the things, we did get 150 prompts. Our wish list was in that general vicinity which um, these were things that they wanted to get to, but never could. Uh, so um, one of the things that Liz did, which was fabulous, was she actually looked at their website to find out what kind of educational materials they had, which were not substantial. So Liz, do you want to talk about that? 
Yeah, I just, I, I, you know, in searching the website, they do have an education section, um, and I found a couple of worksheets that seemed fun to do, but I thought that was a real opportunity for us to kind of create materials in addition to um, to meeting the needs of those prompts. And so we had this, this great framework, these wonderful kind of um, directives or, or opportunities. Um, and so we were able to kind of build, build in a smaller assignment that was an educational tool. Um, and I think we, we catered to different grade levels in there because there really, it really was an open book. And we were able to have students kind of go through the process of, again, uh, like before, taking the information that might have been slightly more complicated um, for a general audience and especially for children and breaking down what's the most important in that and creating something active out of it. Um, so it essentially, essentially them creating a teaching tool um, and giving them a little insight into what we do sometimes um, and kind of distilling the larger body of information uh, for, for the public audience. And definitely this has grown. <clears throat> the park, as you can imagine, has gone through a little bit of change of personnel. Um, we lost our first contact to a park in Oklahoma, and then we... Uh, we shifted over to another individual and that individual, actually the entire Lassen team was taken away by uh, the, the insane fire that took place there, the Dixie fire, which pretty much decimated 75% of the park. But now we're back in, they now have a new education person who's very helpful and we're able to talk to a lot of this, a lot of them about being more specific with what they need, specific grades and things of that nature. So we are catering to the needs of the of the park. And I think that the par partnership itself is very dynamic and ever growing. Um, the assignments this past semester in this is our third sem third semester with them. Um, the assignments they said to us, OK, we want you to concentrate on the Dixie Fire, we want you to, con they, they specified, they were really specific. Uh, a native garden is another thing that they asked us to, to work on. And they wanted us to, they said they have nothing, no educational materials for, uh, for high school. So they wanted us to concentrate on high school students. So we did, um, you know, try to put all of this together. I think that what's key here is that the students began to see a connection between climate change and the environment and health. And I thought that that was very, very important. Um, and through the course of all this, uh, especially in that first semester, I, I went ahead and talked about, I asked the students about the writing in, a, in an informal survey as, and Liz, I believe you covered reading. So do you wanna talk about what, they, what the students said with, the, with respect to reading? Reading in the reading what what uh, what sources they use. Oh, so yeah, so the yeah. accountability and that kind of thing, right? So, right. Um, the students with these assignments, um, yes, they got to make some fun materials and create projects, and that was kind of the nice open part of the assignment. Um, but in their research process, they really had to be careful that they were finding and synthesizing the information accurately and correctly. Um, and also looking in the right places for sources. We had a lot of students going back to Lassen Volcanic National Park website, which is great to kind of get a sense of the organization and to kind of get um, uh, see what they already knew and the information that was already kind of uh, available to them um, or that they had generated, but we really wanted them to kind of um, look outside of that to kind of generate new ideas as well. Um, but with their reading, they had to kind of do a lot of close reading and make sure that the, the way that they were translating things for their projects um, was going to be um, was going to be accurate, was going to be helpful for their audience, was going to fuel an active assignment, um, and that they were breaking down in the information in a way, <clears throat> excuse me, that that was um, that was um, really pinpointing the most important aspects of those articles to create something new. Um, so I think their their reading skills really developed during this course. Um, because they had to think of the literature in multiple ways for multiple uses at the same time. Um, and I think that's something new, especially for college students and, and the first year college students, 
having to do that with information for multiple purposes um, is is something that is is new there. They're still learning really how to to pick apart the text for for multiple uses. And where to get those sources too. Um, and we I discovered with the writing, I asked them, you know, in an informal survey that was uh, that was completed online. Uh, they went ahead and the students told me that they were more careful with their writing because it wasn't just going to a teacher, it was actually going to some scientists and they wanted to not necessarily sound smart, but they wanted to provide information that was accurate and um, and uh, intelligent sounding, so to speak. They wanted to write on their level is basically what I think I'm trying to say. So, um, so if we can flip to the next slide, please. Okay, so we did have some wonderful projects. Um, Liz, I'm gonna let you kick it off because I thought yours were the coolest, but you know. <laughs> well, I was really impressed with my, what my students that particular semester created. Um, they did a great job. Some of them had some artistic skills, which I think is really important. I'm a huge proponent of arts-based research. And so them actually doing something artistic in support of their research project was exciting to me. Um, and so this website on the left was uh, one of my student groups. And um, it was to do with um, climate change and effects on local populations to the park. Um, so really looking into environmental issues that were specific to that landscape. Um, and each of these little icons, and this is all illustrated by one of the group members, um, just using an iPad and the, the doodle tools or whatever is available on there. And they managed to kind of make it look very, um, very professional for a website. Um, and so they've got this map here and each of these little icons uh, brings up a, a pop-up box. So that's what you're seeing on the right hand, the top right hand side of that, um, that picture, the American pika um, and how they're, they're moving to higher elevations because of climate change and finding that kind of cooler air um, and the environments where, where their food will live. And, um, and then down below is another page about climate change in general. So they're not just hitting kind of the specific species, they're kind of breaking down the information, uh, the more general information to, to supply some more context. Right, and the one on the right was just completed this spring. <clears throat> this particular group had to pivot quite a bit, um, but eventually the, uh, the um, rangers at Lassen, the educational ranger at Lassen, um, asked them to come up with an activity booklet that they could give out to children in the uh, at this at the um, at the discovery center or learning center the over by the visitor center. And so in this particular instance, they wanted to concentrate on river otters and what an otter den would look like so that children would not go ahead and go, oh, what you know, what's in here and stick their head in and possibly get hurt. So, that's what they were working on with that particular lesson plan. So if we could go to the next slide, please. And I won't spend too much time on this because I think I'm gonna be kind of rehashing some of the points we already made with the um, assignments and we're running out of time. Um, but so last year, um, I thought it would be great to have another local partnership. So I spoke to FEO and we met with them about what their, um, their wants and needs were. They're a smaller, um, but but significant nature preserve in um, Carmichael, which is just across the river from Rancho where our campus is. Um, and I've been there multiple times. They live fairly close to there. Um, and so we met with them who were very accessible, approachable, um, and they didn't have a specific list of prompts for us like Lassen did, um, but they did have wants and needs for how they wanted their the future of their center to look. And they thought that perhaps we could help with that a little bit um, and substantiate some of the programs they have there already. They have a robust summer, summer camp program. They have a native garden and a playground and ways for people to interact with the environment on a safe level. Um, but safety is also something that's, um, that's uh, pertinent to them. Um, they found that during the pandemic, people didn't know how to interact with the environment safely, simply because they were getting a lot of new people who thought, oh, well, we can't go here, but we can go to a nature center and walk around outside. But then they didn't know how to interact with that environment. 
um, and would do things like going in the preserved grass areas or running to try and catch, you know, touch a deer. And so that was a big no-no, obviously. Um, so they wanted to update their technology. Um, they found engaging with teenage populations, older kids was difficult. People would cycle back when they went to college, but before that, um, and before that, they had lots of kids. Um, some of the extra benefits um, were that students had fairly free reign, but most of them chose to um, concentrate on things that were uh, to do with the health benefits and the mental benefits of spending time in natural environments. Um, and so I really saw a need for that once things opened up a bit more and we were back in the classroom after, after the, the main part of the pandemic. Um, and they got to spend some time at the preserve, which was nice for them. Um, and then they got to work closely with FEO staff. And I think with the Lassen partnership as well, that that accountability to particular staff there um, who are experts in, you know, uh, e ecology and the environment and their priorities for what we're doing are a little different to perhaps what we're doing. So kind of having to meet them um, halfway there or, you know, maybe cater to, to them a little more. It gave students a sense of what a public project is actually like to do. Um, sometimes you don't get to do everything that you want to because it, it's not meeting the needs well enough. So you have to kind of adjust and adapt to what you're doing. Um, so we can move on to the next slide yeah um and so these are a couple of projects um some of my students made um an audio walk to do with um uh, there was a narrative to do with sound pollution like what is it like for an animal living in a semi-urban um, nature preserve and so embodying the experience of a deer and actually Teresa Joy gracefully was the was the person who was the narrator for this the students asked her to do it and she has a great voice for it <laughs> Um, and, and so they, that's a map of FER and people can take the tour and, and, you know, click the QR codes with their phone and then, um, a, an info card for kids. They do a treasure hunt, kind of looking treasure hunt and, and they can get a card. So I'll wrap up there because we're, we want to move on to the, to the next section. Um, yes. So we're looking at the slide marked park projects, reflection and plan moving forward. Uh, Lassen Volcanic National Park continues to be an active partner in the English 120. Um, and through Lassen Volcanic National Park, we were able to pick up a partnership with Chihuahuan Desert Inventory Monitoring Network. Uh, and that one encompasses seven national parks. So we're doing some work with them as well. And that and with the Chihuahuan Desert um, connection, we are also uh, really bracing ourselves for some intense work across the disciplines, which makes me very excited. Um, Emily is going to be doing some work on capturing DNA from air particles in Chihuahuan Desert. And um, if I'm not mistaken, Rosemary, who will be speaking next, is going to be working with water quality. Uh, in the desert. So we're uh, getting started with that. We're ramping up with that. Um, and with that, I think it's time to turn it over to our colleagues. Thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you for that segue. So now we have a um, biogenetist and a chemist. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Damon for those that maybe missed that. Uh, so now for something completely different for those that are fans of Monty Python. Anybody? Okay, okay, good. All right, so uh, what we're gonna finish off with is another project that we have our freshmen do. So what you saw from our English faculty is that also first year uh, composition and then the research course, they do uh, basically outreach with local parks and national parks. But then also as part of that, we have within the science sciences, so our labs, chemistry and bio, they do this project known as islands. So obviously you can see it's an acronym. We love our acronyms in academia. Uh, essentially what it is, is a project that spans their entire first year in both biology and chemistry laboratories. Because one of the crux that we have in the sciences is we do want our students to present and also write more right? So professional communications, but sometimes it's really challenging in a large lecture-based class where you have 150, 
300, 500 students or more, right? So the laboratories are a great environment where you have a smaller group of students where you can essentially have them do authentic writing assignments related to a project that they're working on. And so this is a uh, type of project that's known that that's done in other places. Austin, Texas is actually a key place for these types of authentic research um, initiatives known as CURES, course-based undergraduate research experiences. Uh, and so this is our version of a freshman cure, okay? So as you can see that little prompt there, what we, uh, we have to learn, we learn by doing. This can be a mantra for a lot of different things. You can talk a lot in uh, any sort of course about writing, but actually doing it and the process of doing it Laboratory research is, you know, much the same thing. They get way more excited actually getting their hands in there and doing something. And so part of the project, you can see our little clams there. Those are our model organism. So if you want to go on to the next slide, please. Uh, we actually have our students go out to the river system and they dig up the clams. They do put on those lovely waders so they don't get too wet. They're not forced to do this. So if they don't want to do it, they don't have to go in the water. But generally speaking, once they see some of their peers go out there and start having fun, they're more than happy to put on some waders, grab a shovel and dig up some clams. Now the clam species we uh, analyze is an invasive clam species. It's known as the Asian clam. So we do have a permit to dig it up from uh, the local fish and wildlife. But because it's an invasive organism, they're more than happy to let us dig up as many as we like. Um, and so they visit sites of concern that we've already identified that have the Asian clam species. They go out, go out and dig up these indicator organisms. They also collect water and soil samples. And then they take the clams back to the laboratory and they uh, harvest the tissue that they then use to actually um, uh, do other experiments on, both in chemistry and bio labs. Um, and really what we're doing is we're using this clam organism as a bioindicator species for the health of the aquatic uh, environment that they're in. Because they're filter feeders, they actually filter a lot of not just like algae and bacteria in the water, but also any like heavy metals or other types of maybe deleterious like fertilizer runoff or things like that that could be in the water that if the clams are stressed and we can you know identify like clam stress through biomarkers that perhaps other organisms within the aquatic system are also stressed, fish, right, amphibians, et cetera. And then they do give a final poster presentation at the very end, but embedded across the entire year, there's a lot of different writing assignments they're required to do that are scaffolded from anything from writing the intro, methodology, results, discussion, and abstract. And so my colleague, uh, Rosemary Efron, is going to actually talk about some of these more you know uh, um, assignments that we have that are scaffolded throughout the year and then culminating with that final poster presentation All right so. oh thank you so much damon and thank you my name is rosemary and welcome to our presentation or continuing presentation so i'm a chemist an analytical chemist by training and uh, my area of research is environmental chemistry. So no wonder I'm involved with the environment. So we have a, a freshman coming. Our curriculum is built such that research is embedded into the coursework, the lab, okay? Chemistry lab, biology lab, research and that research component is the acronym island interdisciplinary science learning and novel discovery okay it spans two semesters the first semester we do a lot a lot of collaboration between disciplines for instance we will start by them having to know how to use the library resources. That's the first thing. They collaborate with the librarian. So actually, I do give the librarian my syllabus and the island project, what would be covered. So the librarian is already aware of what is going on in the labs. So she is prepared, okay? 
because I'll be sending the students to, to, the, uh, to her to help out. So that's the first level of a collaboration besides between the disciplines, there's the collaboration with the librarian. Then after that, they know how to use the library resources. They are now going to identify a research area. Since I'm a chemist, the biologist has already told you the species of target there, marker is the invasive Asian clam. Okay, for me, there are four areas. When we started, it has evolved. When we started, I just gave them the latitude. I said, what would you like to, what intrigues you? Some said nitrate, I want to find out nitrate in water. I said, okay, just like that. Another said lead, another, hey, calcium, things like that. So, but now, so that we can channel it and have some meaningful data collection, we have now targeted four areas. Lead concentration in the water, the natural body of water, which is the American river, iron, dissolved oxygen, and water hardness. All these affect the Asian clam. Why is it thriving? Why? We want to know why it's thriving. Here are the chemical components that are helping it. So that's what we monitor, okay? Now, now that they have identified the research area, they are now going to write a research statement or a proposal. They are now going to tailor it. What would you like to, okay? Now that they have a research statement, now with that research statement, I started in the lab with them. But then here comes another collaboration. I send them to the writing center. We are GLEs, okay? Okay, so the writing center handles and malleates and knows how to shape it so that it is targeted. It's inviting people can say, oh, that's the research statement. Or they can call it a research question, okay? So that's the next thing. That's another level of collaboration. Then, now that they have that, they are now going to go ahead and do their literature search. Remember, I taught, we have already taught them how to use their literature, uh, their library resources. So they know it. So now send them over to the, uh, Sadie, the librarian, and they do their literature search. That's the first. Now, with that leaf, they will come up. It's like going to fish. There is a wide, you cast the net. A lot of things you catch, everything, shrimp, that, they are there, little snakes, they are there. Then they have to refine their searches to reflect what they are trying to investigate. Then the next thing would be introduction. I start off by teaching them how to write a meaningful introduction, and then they proceed with the writing center. Again, do you see all the writing components? So we work in partnership. We are right from the get-go showing our students that, yes, you want to be medical doctors, you want to be healthcare providers, but you need to be able to communicate effectively. And you do that through collaboration. Don't try to do it alone. It would be frustrating collaborate and they see it with the faculty, with the staff, with the administrators. Oh, he wears two hats. He's a faculty as well as an administrator. He's the dean. So I just wanted to mention that. Now, <laughs> now the next thing that we do, we are done with introduction is experimentation. Okay, with this, with the introduction, they will be, I'm a chemist, we are finicky about referencing materials and they must use the ACS form of referencing citation of their sources, okay? Then they progress to go on to materials. What materials, what reagents will you use? 
all those, the inventory, what equipment will you use in your experimentation? Okay, they do that and they progress further to, well, remember this is first semester. It's more of a proposal. So they, what type of result? From here, I'm able to show them, look, with a proposal that you are writing, you can use this in any discipline. You may want to seek money from somebody. The person giving you the money would want to know what type of results do you expect? So they would predict. It's a prediction of what type of results based on literature, okay? Then they will continue and they've done the describe and again, the writing center comes in to help them. Another key thing that we do is ethical consideration, bioethics and chem ethics. They have to bring that component in to their writing. And when they've done all this, then they will put it on a template, a poster template, and there is peer review. Give it to your peers to review. Then when they pass that, go to the writing center again to help you to, you know, mash it out so that it's meaningful. And finally, of course, there would be acknowledgement in the poster, and then they would be able to make a presentation. That presentation is the triple I showcase. That is the first semester. They are brand new from high school, their first semester of uh, undergraduate studies, they are making a presentation, okay? That is their first semester. In the second semester, we go further. The same thing, but this time with the second semester, it is now the actual thing that Damon has already shown you. With the second semester, could you go forward? Yes, it happens in the spring, okay? With the second semester, now you have to find a good, all the different things that we did in the first semester, they already have research experience. They would be going out to the river, voluntary, but trust me, all of them want to. They will go out to the river to be able to uh, actually, I go with them because we chemists, analytical chemists, we are very finicky about sample collection can influence the results big time. So I have to go them and show them how to collect the sample. And the sample I'm talking about because of my interest, I'm interested in the soil and water. The biologist will be collecting the clams. Mine is the water and the soil. And I'll be able to show them that wherever you collect your sample can influence the result that you get. So they have to know how to collect sample um, water properly. Bring it to the lab. And then we go through what we have done. This time they are in groups. The groups are done such that the, the groups that are in biology keep the same group in chemistry. That way there's continuity. They are talking, you know, on the same thing that they are investigating, okay? And the final, they keep going. They do all their experimentations and results and um, ethical consideration, chem ethics and bioethics. And the end result is what they have, the research day showcase, undergraduate research day showcase. And it, for this year, it happened on May 4th, a Thursday, with a poster presentation, one of which is, if you could test it. There we go. This is one of the posters of the island project. 
And these three students, that's their poster. And the poster cover because it's interdisciplinary, it's island. So their research from biology is there and the one of their chemistry. This group, I think they did dissolved oxygen. Another group did lead. Another group did water hardness. And how does it relate? How does it influence that clam, that invasive species? So that is how we embed research into our undergraduate. And this is, just, this is just the lab component. There is the lecture component which I also teach, but it's not for this, because that one is about the periodic table. That's for another day. <laughs> so here we have a, oh, by the way, for you to see this, not they are being graded, and it's also a competition. And the competition is anybody can be a judge. So while the material is very technical, they should be able to communicate with anybody. So we tally all the grades that come in from the judges. You, there's no qualification for you to be a judge. So they go around the posters, talk to the different presenters and score them. And we tally the score and there's a first place winner, a second place winner and a third place winner. So that is how we encourage our students to be excited about research and collaboration and the benefits of learning from each other. I learn every day from my students as you can see with my colleagues, with the blog. I also learned from my colleagues too, because when Teresa Joy here and Emily, they made a little presentation about, we call it Miko Miko, you know, anything coming up, we bring it up and then we talk about somebody volunteers. I can talk about it or what I'm doing. They did something like this. I said, ha, huh, blogs. I do discussion board. I think I would want to do blogs too. So I did blog for undergraduate, that is for my uh, freshmen. That's for another day. <laughs> Thank you so much. Let me leave time so we can ask questions. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, uh, <laughs> We are right on time, actually. They told us to leave 15 minutes for questions. So do we have any Q&A for any of the presenters? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna unshare this so we can see all of our presenters, right? I wanna hear about nursing. Can you unshare, bring all the presenters up? I don't know whose hand was up first. Okay, well, there's time for both, I'm sure. Yeah. Can you make them big? Make them full screen, all four of them, or three of them. Collaborations with outside um, in terms of like you as you know faculty member or group of faculty members setting up those collaborations. Um, how much labor are you usually putting into kind of like oh, sure. Yeah, no problem. Um, so my question was for the folks collaborating um, with outside groups or even you know internal university groups is um, how much. Um, labor are you putting in to sort of keep those collaborations fresh and active, sort of keep a connection to whoever you're working with? And kind of what does that look like to do that successfully? I think that's for Jill and Liz. <laughs> well, with respect to Lassen Volcanic National Park, um, I there's generally a group of us, about five of us, who meet at the end of every semester to talk about the upcoming semester and what it is that they'd like to see um, emphasis on. So two hours in the year, <laughs> I mean, it's, so it's pretty minor. Um, and then uh, between Liz and I, I think we, we took about a week, right? To go ahead and collaborate and hash the whole thing out. I think so. It wasn't, you know, it was really integrated in our regular prep 
period, whatever that looked like for a particular assignment. Um, and and I found, find the same with, with FEO, but actually I think FEO may still be or has recently been working with the service learning program at CHS as well. Um, so that, that kind of connection has been kept across departments, um, but sometimes it's just a every couple months or so just saying hello how's it going how are the projects working out which ones are you using and getting a little feedback on what was useful and what could we do differently next time we collaborate um and um and i i went to feo last weekend um to kind of see how the playground was going and, and really just take my child to play but um but it's kind of nice to stay connected to that landscape as an active participant as well. I find that's that's maybe important with the local organization so that I can say, you know, I noticed this, maybe we could work on this. What do you think about that? So uh, not much and it's very enjoyable um, and it's you know easy to check in via email anyway. And at the end of the semester, um, I send the projects out to Lassen um, and to the specific scientists that was assigned to a specific team. Um, the people who were doing bear awareness and bear canisters, for example, that particular scientist was working with them and they'll get a copy of their research paper and their project. Any related questions or? If you are a local, uh, but then also for the national parks is incredible. Right, because they're they're desperate for uh, collaborations, and we're part of the community, so it's good to be part of that community in a very visible way. So yeah, so the more we can encourage that across, you know, different institutions, the better. Do we have any related? Okay, great. Okay, great. My question was about uh, faculty participation. I'm a huge proponent of of service learning, but it does involve some labor as, you know, maybe some extra labor. And so I'm wondering how faculty came to be involved. Is it something that is promoted or did it, where did, where did that, where did those collaborations come from? Uh, and do you have like a central service learning uh, program that, uh, that helps coordinate? Um, I'll let Jill and Liz quickly, and then I also want to respond to that. Please. Um, for, for myself, my one of my area exams is in service learning, um, specifically as it relates to uh, writing and rhetoric. So um, it, for me, this was kind of like just a natural extension of something I always wanted to do. Um, and I don't like the idea of students writing only for me, because then they just don't do the best job that they possibly can. Um, it's good you know, it just goes to her. But if it goes to everybody or somebody who's in a bigger position, then they're a little bit more serious about it, I think. Um, with respect, to, we do have a service learning department of which Teresa Joy is a part of, and she'll talk about that. Um, but working with, you had asked about working with others. Um, it's pretty, we're a smaller campus, but it's no one, we don't have departments in the traditional sense. So um, across the hall from me and the co-director of the writing center is a chemist. Who knew? So, you know, I'll just pop in and say, hi, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and Liz, I think that was pretty much how we started out, too. Yeah, I think so. And um, I think it's just a... a a natural extension to um, to an extent of you know at least for me having worked a lot in the arts world and working with outside organizations a lot very natural to me to to reach out to people um, for partnerships um, and um, it kind of ha happened that in, in a similar in a similar way um, and you know environmental writing is something that's also important to me and so and it makes sense for the courses um, so it. Really, I mean, at our institution as well, we're small, so we're kind of able to reach out um, and kind of create these these feasible partnerships. Uh, but then I'll, I'll pass it to service learning because I know that they're, they're experts in this. They work with outside partners all of the time. And so um, Teresa Joy can kind of talk to how that happens. Thank you so much. So really, it was inspiration of uh, Jill with Lassen and Liz with FAYA. 
And at our university, I can't believe this, but we have two required service learning courses in addition to what we're talking about today, which I think is phenomenal. So students have to take two courses. Plus we have an elective in their final year or for post -backs. So our students get a lot of work in the community. And so we do have those in addition and we're always developing partnerships. And as, as um, uh, Liz mentioned, we do continue the FAYA partnership in, in Lesson as well. My students worked with Lesson through their service learning. But we do tend to, I tend to focus on food insecurity issues in my service learning courses. So working with um, impoverished population and people who don't have enough to eat because we are a health science school. Um, probably another topic, but thank you so much. Other questions? Uh, one other thing I just wanna pop in and say is that we do have two service learning instructors. So you can see just from the volume, we have Dr. Paveda and Dr. Kramer, um, just by having both of them there, you can see how important service is in this institution um, to have dedicated people for service learning. I'm sorry, I should mention too that is definitely on topic with what we're talking about today because at least how I got into service learning was I wanted my students to have real purpose and audience for their writing, right? Just as Jill and Liz wanted them to have a a real reason for writing. And so it is, it's a very good question in this context. Thank you. Okay, we quieted everybody. We do have a couple of questions that have been posted in Google. Oh, thank you oh. so much. How do we do that? Yeah. Um, well, I've got them right here. Uh, so the first one was posted at 1046. This is from Eric Runwald. Um, and it reads, uh, how did you teach analogy slash metaphor and get them to be accurate and impactful? He follows that up with another question. Also, what were the benefits of them working as a team? Any challenges? Great. Well, I think the first one is Emily, right, Emily? And yes. you can take the second one too. Go ahead. Okay. So that first one was, how do you teach analogy? Um, I will admit that I don't do, I don't focus a lot on teaching the writing, which is something that is maybe something I need to work on actually. Um, but I teach the content and the way that I teach the content in my course, I use analogy just to try to explain the complexities of the immune system pretty regularly. So I think they pick up on that. Um, and then um, I guess the main place that I teach the writing is they bring me a draft about a week before their final draft is supposed to be posted. And we do just like a, a group, you know, not one-on-one, -on -one, but like with the group um sort of go through their writing and talk about like how do we make this more impactful and how you know can you most of the time like I said they bring me a research paper so then I can kind of help them brainstorm like okay well how do we take this from being a research paper that no one's probably going to want to read um and make it into something that's exciting and fun can we put narrative in it is there an analogy that you guys really connect with can you think of some other way of explaining it so I try to kind of pull it out of them um, in that sort of meeting context where we're just meeting with the one group at a time. Um, so in the classroom context, I don't talk about metaphor as much, although I mean, they see me use it, uh, but then most of the sort of writing feedback happens in that one-on-one -on -one meeting. Um, so I, hopefully that helps a little bit. I probably could do a better job at that. That's something I would like to work on. Um, and then the second question was about group work. Um, I do think that they benefit a lot from working in groups. Um, there are always complaints and it's something that I'm always working on trying to make sure that I have um, structurally supported them in working as a group. Um, so I do group contracts in the very beginning where I encourage them to put in sort of what things they're committed to doing and um, internal due dates for themselves so that like they can make sure that they put in there like we will have the draft done three days before we meet with the professor so that we can put it together and like try to put on the calendar meeting dates to make sure they actually meet and work together. I don't know how effective that is. I'm working on getting some surveys to try to figure out if that helps or not. Um, but then I always encourage them to reach out to me if group work isn't going well. Um, and uh, we do talk about sort of how I, I try to get them thinking at least about after the fact, like what worked, what didn't work, uh, what would you do again next time or not. Um, I do surveys at the end about which, you know, did do you feel like everyone contributed equally? And um, I also, as they turn in their blogs, they have to turn in a version to me that has like delineated which people did which parts, um, just so that I can kind of keep an eye and make sure that people know that they're responsible for putting in the work. 
Um, I, I think in every class I get maybe one group that struggles and has one person who just doesn't do very much. Um, but I try to reinforce that, like, if you don't do much, you're not going to get the grade. <laughs> like, it's, you can't just float along. So trying to balance that, like, encouraging the group to work together to create a better product. And I think most of them do see that just from doing it, that, like, hearing the different ideas and collaborating is a fun experience for most of them. Um, and then also sort of balancing that with, like, individual responsibility and the idea that your grade will be based on the part that you've contributed helps keep people from falling off the end, I think. But um, and it's another thing that I struggle with every semester. So if other people have ideas, I'd love to hear them. I'm always introducing new ideas to try to support that group work because I know that's um, a challenge. But our students at our school do a lot of group work in all of their classes from the very beginning. So um, my class is a 300 and 400 level courses. So by the time they hit me, they're usually pretty good at working with other people in groups, which is great. And Jill? Yeah, uh, Liz and I both have taught using group projects. Um, I don't, it's never without its problems, but um, I think one of the things that I do that's a little bit different is I have them write an individual paper, each person, and then they don't get to see those papers until the, they, they have to start working on the collaborative end so that every voice is heard and every voice is included. And I think that's really important is that everybody knows that there's they got a stake. But Liz, you want to speak about any anything with this? Yeah, um, just uh, adding to what you said about the, the individual papers. So yeah, they, they write their individual papers that either they're interested in or they've been or maybe not been assigned, but chosen from uh, a list. Um, and then when we put them in groups, they're able to kind of sometimes sometimes they have to kind of pick one that they're interested in everyone's for that and they go with that direction but sometimes they're able to bring their research papers together in a sense and at least topically and figure out how how those two topics meet um how they work together and then create something from there which is i think a really important part of this the the, the group work in the in the 120 partnerships um, because they're able to widen their knowledge immediately um, and synthesize new information um, to an authentic authentic end. Um, and that's really exciting. So that sometimes, you know, they're more invested perhaps because no one's taking a subordinate role in the group or feels like they're they're not interested or they can't do something and they have to kind of learn a skill to do that. So so yeah, it, it starts off at a, in a pretty equitable place, I think. Thank you. I just wanted to see if Damon or um, Rosemary want to add to this topic. Not really. I think, I think you all understand by uh, ingrating individually versus groups. And so it's it's always going to be a challenge. And I think just being aware of it and trying to improve as much as you can, but there will always be individuals that won't contribute as well and trying to isolate them and then not like hurt the whole group just because one individual is just not invested at all. It's yeah, it's always gonna be a challenge. But in this day and age, communication and working as a team is so valuable and delineating responsibilities that they have to learn that to be working professionals in the future, right? We all have to do it ourselves. I mean, this panel, six people, right? We all had to collaborate and like I'd love to slack, but no, they they won't let me. No, I'm kidding. But yeah. So yeah, exactly. Well, uh, for me, I do uh, collaboration in the lab setting. And by that, I actually do this with them. I'm in my organic chemistry class, organic chemistry lab class, they work in pairs. So I just, based on the hood, one, one, two, two, three, three, they attend hoods. And then I put them into a basket or a beaker. Uh, well, I'm in the lab, I put it in a beaker and then just mix it and bring it. Hey, Damon, your lucky number. You pick it. He picks six. She picks three. He pick, uh, she picks uh, one. And uh, she picks six. Okay. What number do you have? Six. Who has six? Damon, that's your partner. You know why? The rationale is they want to be healthcare providers. Do they get to choose their patients? The answer is no. That's it. That's how I make my point. 
Thank you so much. Could we take one more question, maybe? Or uh, there's one through Wova. It's time. Okay. All right. Just hang out, I guess. Okay. Maybe we can talk to you separately. Thank you all so much.